welcome to your first online lecture for our online biology class. Guys, this is an amazing time to be studying biology. And as I say up here, it ain't your grandma's biology class. What are the kinds of things they're doing in biology now? What kinds of things are you going to be learning in this class? Well, we've got glowing pigs, cloned sheep, flies with legs growing out of their head, genetically modified organisms, climate change, any kind of thing in biotechnology you can imagine. And it's all based on this molecule right here, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. My name is Bree Day, and I'm going to be your guide through this course. Starting with this first lecture, we're, we're going to give you an introduction to biology, what you're going to be learning in this course, as well as an introduction into the way biologists do their work, and that's called the scientific method of inquiry. So if you're ready, I'm ready, let's get started. Well, you say, okay, I'm a psychology major, I'm a English major, I'm a basket weaving major, why do I need to take biology? Well, as you'll find out this course, uh, biology is in the news everywhere. So the things they're doing to study the brain, I mean, do you know that they've actually invented stuff now where you can put a headset on your head and make an object move by thinking about it? Yes, that is not science fiction. They've actually done it and the prospects for video gaming and all sorts of things. So are you a psychology major? It's all about the brain, definitely biology. Maybe you're interested in criminal justice or you want to be a police officer. DNA, it's all about the crime scene right, right now, right? So forensics, forensic biology is a field where they use DNA to solve crimes, figure out who done it. Maybe you're into agriculture. You know, genetically modified organisms versus organic, big issue there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. So no matter what your major is, learning biology will make you more aware of the world. And it might even make you think about life in a different way. So, for example, you go to the grocery store, you want to buy some hamburger meat. Well, does it matter to you where that hamburger meat came from? For example, did you know that the FDA has, that's the Food and Drug Administration, has declared that cloned livestock is safe to eat? Yes, cloned livestock, just like Dolly the sheep, except in this case we're talking about cows. That means that that cow did not need a father to come into existence. How do you feel about that? They also have said cloned salmon's okay. So maybe you're perfectly fine with it. Maybe you want to do your own research on it. Do we know how safe this stuff is? Have, have these techniques been around long enough to really know what the long-term effects, if any, are. So just some of the ethical things and personal things you may have to think about in this course. So let's get started with the hierarchy of life. Anybody know how many species are out there? Well, if you said we don't know, the answer is you are correct because it's been estimated there could be anywhere from 10 million to 100 million species out there most of which we haven't even begun to discover, yet we're often losing species faster than we're discovering them because of habitat degradation, often due to human activities. So despite that, there's this immense amount of diversity. Things come in all shapes and sizes from bacteria and viruses on up to things like elephants and blue whales. How are we going to categorize it all? Well, we humans like to stick things into nice categories, and nowadays they actually stick them into categories based on something real, and that is their evolutionary relatedness to each other, their genetic relatedness. Uh, so in this course, we're going to go from the itty bitty to the really, really big. So we're going to start off uh, with our second lesson in this unit talking about some basic chemistry of life. So we're going to go actually from the subatomic talking about particles that make up an atom, and from there, we're going to put those particles together to make an atom, which is the smallest unit that can't be divided without changing its properties. Um, when you stick multiple atoms together, two or more, you get a molecule or a compound. And where biology comes in here is certain molecules put together in certain ways, you end up with something called a cell, and that is considered to be the basic unit of life. Well, we'll spend quite a lot of time talking about this basic unit of life, the cell. What's it made of? How does it reproduce? What's it, its metabolism like? What does it do? How does it work? So, and how do you get a single cell, put it together with some other single cells, and suddenly you get a multi-celled organism like us? So when you put multiple cells together, before you get to the organism level, you get to things called tissues. So you can think of 
uh, for example, the tissue that makes up your heart or the tissue that makes up your um, liver, etc. And these tissues put together can form organs such as the heart or the liver or the skin. Your skin is considered to be an organ. And when these organs function together in a certain way, they can create an organism, a body that actually does things where all these little components are cooperating and working together in tandem. How does it happen? Well, we know the basics, but there's always some mystery behind that that we haven't solved. And that keeps the process of biological science going. Now, when organisms of the same species, the same kind, get together and they interact with each other, we call this a population of those organisms. So, for example, uh, everybody, all the humans living in your house, that would be one population. All the humans living in your neighborhood is another population. And all the neighborhoods in the country, all the humans that make those up would be another population. So just different scales of the same thing. But when you have populations of different species interacting with each other, so for example, humans interacting with dogs, interacting with trees, interacting with fish, all of those together make up what we call a community in biology. And so communities involve lots of different kinds of inter interactions. So towards the end of the semester, we start learning a little bit of a field of biology called ecology. And ecology deals with things like competition between organisms and predator-prey relationships and, and that kind of thing. And now you take those communities and you take all the communities making up the earth and everywhere where life occurs, and we call that the um, biosphere. And these biospheres are made up of not just communities of organisms, but also the non-living things on the earth. So this would be the water, the air, the, um, the rocks, things like that that are going to make up the ecosystem when they're interacting with living communities. And so anywhere where life occurs, be it on land, in the ocean, in the air, anywhere where life occurs, even in the ice of Antarctica, um, that is part of what we call the biosphere. So biosphere is anywhere on Earth where life occurs. So given that, that's kind of where we're going from the itty bitty all the way up through to the biosphere level. But now let's take that hierarchy of life and start breaking it down into its particular categories. And we're going to start off with the broadest category, and that's called the domain. So the funny thing is when I was in college, some years ago, not that long ago, but in the 90s, late 90s and early 2000s, um, they actually didn't use the term domain very much. They used uh, kingdom as the broadest category. But now they've recognized through DNA evidence that there are three domains of life. And we're going to break these into bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And uh, the domain eukarya is also called eukaryota. So guess which one we fit in, if you just look at the pictures here. Uh, over here we see my absolute favorite animal on Earth. Uh, this is called the star-nosed mole. This happens to be right here, uh, his nose. How cool is that? And these are his amazing claws. So he happens to be the world's fastest eater and a great smeller because he spends most of his life underground. And because he spends most of his life underground, he said, eh, I don't need eyesight so much. So evolutionary processes have traded in the energy that would be spent on the eyes and instead put them to things he could really use, like smell and these amazing claws for digging through the, through the soil. So the star nose mole is a multicellular organism. You and I are multicellular organisms. Trees are multicellular organisms, as are plants, as are fish, as are your pet dog. And so all the multicellular organisms on Earth and a few single-celled organisms called protists are part of this domain called eukaryota or eukarya. It means the same thing. So we are eukaryotes because we're members of the domain eukarya. Now we have domain bacteria here, and you kind of probably kind of guessed what kinds of organisms are in domain bacteria, and that is bacteria. So all the bacteria of the world fit into domain bacteria. So these are single-celled organisms. That means their whole body consists of one cell. Guess how many cells make up the human body? Trillions. 
And if you don't know what a trillion is, uh, go look at the U.S. debt. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Okay, so bacteria is made up of single-celled organisms, and these cells are different from the kinds of cells that make up eukaryotes like you and I. They don't have lots of little compartments that do lots of little things, and we call those little compartments organelles. So eukaryotes, our cells are made up of, um, have these little organelles that do different things. We'll be spending a lot of time talking about those. Bacteria don't have the organelles. They're very simple. They just have a, a circular piece of DNA, um, just one of them, and they got some ribosomes in there and things like that, but very, very simplistic in that sense. It doesn't matter if you're simplistic. These guys have us licked in a lot of situations. So, for example, tuberculosis in Russia. Oh, my gosh. Resistant to some of the last resort antibiotics because the bacteria are evolving so fast. So we'll get into those kinds of issues a little bit later. And uh, the third domain is called archaea. And these guys are what you call the extremophiles in many cases. That means they love to live in extreme environments like thermal vents and uh, ice, ice cores in, in Antarctica or swamps, things like that. So it can be, for example, thermophiles. Files means love. Thermo means heat. So these guys live in the thermal vents and uh, are heat lovers, thermophiles. Uh, they also include halophiles. Halo means salt, so these guys are salt lovers. And here's a picture of some various archaea right here. They're kind of recent uh, discoveries, actually, but they've we couldn't have all the amazing stuff of biotechnology if it wasn't for the discovery of some of the thermophile archaea. Um, so anyway, three domains of life, millions and millions and millions of species out there that fit into these three categories. And so... All diverse, but the interesting thing is, despite the amazing diversity of these three domains, there's amazing similarities, too, when you get down to the DNA level. For example, we're about 70% genetically identical to yeast. Yeast, the fungi you make beer out of and, and bread and, and grow on your foot for athlete's foot. 70% identical to a human. How does that happen? Well, this semester, you are going to learn that. It's pretty amazing. So, all diverse yet just variations on an evolutionary theme. So let's take the rest of the classification. So we know that domain is the broadest category, but after domain, we have several other categories. And I'm going to give you a mnemonic device that's going to help you to memorize these. King Philip came over from Germany slap happy, or you could say stoned, whichever one fits there best for you. So I like to say dumb King Philip for domain. So dumb for domain. King, King Philip came over from Germany slap happy. And this stands for king is kingdom. Philip is phylum. Came is class. Over is order. From is family. Germany is genus. And slap happy is species. So. Say the whole Linnaean classification system with me. And again, Linnaean classification system, because Linnaeus was the guy who kind of came up with most of this. So, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Now, see if you can say it five times fast. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Woo! All right. So, learn those. They're going to be important. But now let's see if we can take an example of how we would fit a species into this Linnaean classification system. So let's start off with, of course, a human. And this happens to be a very special human here. This is E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, who is one of the most famous biologists of modern biology. Um, got to meet him once. Kind of boring speaker. But anyway, fascinating guy, and he's done amazing work. He studied ants, and he's one of the big pioneers of conservation biology. Well, there's four kingdoms within domain eukarya. Um, so... These are protista. So protista are those single-celled eukaryotes that I talked to you about a little bit before. So protista includes the protists, um, things like uh, malaria. The, the animal or the organism that causes malaria is a protist. Um, there's many, many others, paramecium that you'll look at actually in your online lab here. Um, now protists are single-celled, uh, most of them, with the exception of algae. But, you know, their whole body consists of a single cell, 
yet that cell has organelles just like the cells that make up you and I and, and a tree. Um, and so for that reason, they're, they fall under domain eukarya. So we got the protist, kingdom protista. We got kingdom fungi, which include, guess what? Fungi, whether you're talking about yeast cells or those cute mushrooms, portobello mushrooms, they're all in, uh, in kingdom fungi. Plantae, which are the plants, obviously, so everything from trees to grass to uh, roses. And kingdom animalia, which are the animals. And that includes E.O. Wilson, that includes you, that includes me, that includes your dog, the star-nosed mole, the bird, and insects. We're all animals, so kingdom animalia. So for humans, domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata. And that means that we're chordates, i.e. we have spinal cords, we have backbones. So we have a backbone, um, your star-nosed mole has a backbone, and your dog has a backbone. Plants don't have backbones, fungi don't have backbones, protists don't have backbones, but um, not all animals have backbones either. So insects are animals, they're kingdom animalia, but they are invertebrates. They don't have backbones, so they don't fit in our phylum. So domain eukarya for humans, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, class mammalia. What do you think that means? That means you and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals. So. We're mammals. What makes us mammals? Well, okay, you know, we have fur, well-ish, we kind of have fur. There's a bunch of other characteristics that are, make, are similar between us and other mammals, but the very, very key to being a mammal is that we have the ability to produce milk for our young. Um, so we have mammary glands, and hence mammalia. And that's kind of crazy. Okay, well, females, obviously, right? You have a baby, you can produce milk and, and milk your baby. Did you know that Human males also have the potential to produce milk. Yeah, fun stuff to tell your friends at parties, right? They do, they got all the same plumbing, they just don't have the same hormones. Now, if they did have the same hormones, and this happens on occasion, then they can produce milk. So, for example, there are males that have breast cancer that actually can start producing milk or the precursors to milk. Um, there are uh, male babies, newborn babies that are born that can actually start um, having secretions from their nipples because they were exposed to their mother's hormones. Ah, crazy stuff, huh? But anyway, just like um, other primates, like um, monkeys, gorillas, just like dogs, just like cats, just like whales and dolphins, we are all mammals and we can produce milk under the right conditions, hormonal conditions. Now, so domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, class mammalia, order primates, or the primates. So we are primates. Our, our eyes are up front. You know, we have prehensile, well, we don't have prehensile tails, most of us, but there are people born with tails, believe it or not. Anyway, lots of, uh, lots of reasons why we are primates. So this makes us cousins, not descendants, but cousins with gorillas with chimpanzees. Uh, we're actually over 98% genetically identical to chimpanzees. How crazy is that? Um, and we've shared a common ancestor with all other primates. Now, when we get to evolutionary biology, we're gonna dispel a lot of myths that are out there. We didn't come from monkeys, but we shared a common ancestor with them. So we'll get into that more when we talk about evolutionary biology. Okay, domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, class mammalia, order primates, family hominidae and hominidae means we walk on two feet we're bipedal and as far as we know we are really the only living bipedal primate that exists anymore now some people believe in bigfoot but you know that's a different story but as far as we know as far as scientists know we're the only hominids left now that doesn't mean there were no other hominids in existence prior. So um, as far as we know, other than humans, all the other hominids have gone extinct. So Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus, uh, the hobbit man, which was discovered not too long ago, maybe a decade or so ago, it was about a three foot hominid that, um, that was not human, but it was another hominid. So it was very closely related to us in the same family. Now, one of the things you'll notice about the family name is they always end in AE. So hominids are of the family hominidae. Okay, so that means we walk on two feet. We're in the genus Homo, and you'll notice that um, Homo is capitalized here. So always you capitalize the genus name of, of, a, um, 
of the genus. And the genus is capitalized when we get to species later, you'll see what I mean. So as far as we know, we're the only living Homo genus left. Um, once upon a time, there were others, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, et cetera, et cetera. Homo floresinensis. And finally, species, we are Homo sapiens. So this is what I was talking about just a second ago, which I didn't say so well. Um, the species name includes the genus name in it. So the genus Homo is always capitalized. And the rest of the species name is lowercase. And usually Homo sapiens, or usually the species name is either italicized or underlined. So here you can see here I've italicized it. Okay, so real quick, one more time. The classification of humans, domain, eukarya, kingdom, animalia, phylum, chordata, class, mammalia, order, primates, family, hominidae, genus Homo, Species Homo sapiens. So we'll be encountering species names a lot this semester. So just a real briefly, what we're going to be talking about this in this course. So we're going to be doing a lot of talk of organisms, and we're going to break these organisms into two categories. So you've had three domains, but two of those domains can kind of be lumped together. And that is uh, bacteria and archaea get lumped together because they're both single-celled um, organisms that have no organelles. And so those guys both fall into the category called prokaryotes. This means before the nut, prokaryotes. That means they're kind of um, believed to be more primitive, um, sort of have a primitive uh, history to them compared to eukaryotes. And eukaryotes are considered to be more modern because we're more complex, uh, took longer over evolutionary time to come into existence. Uh, here's just a couple pictures here. There's my star nose mole, gotta stick them on every slide. But here's a bacterial cell, and this bacteria happens to be uh, Helobacter pylori, H. pylori. This guy is the one that um, infects some people's stomachs and can lead to such severe acid reflux that it's, um, it contributes to things like esophageal cancer. Uh, the guy that discovered H. pylori and its effects, its effects leading to esophageal cancer actually won a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, what do we got up here? A tobacco plant, but it's glowing because we've inserted the gene that makes jellyfish glow into that tobacco plant. Oh, such fun. Okay, so uh, after this uh, first lesson, we're going to be learning about the chemistry of life. Then we're going to get into DNA. How cool is that? And cells. Then we're going to get into cell form and function. A little bit about how plants breathe and how animals breathe. So photosynthesis and respiration. Then apply some of these skills we've learned into the wonderful world of genetics and biotechnology. And this is where we say it ain't your grandma's biology class because the stuff we're doing now, total science fiction back then. They could not have imagined what we can do now. Then we're going to take that, those principles of genetics and apply them to the world of evolutionary theory. And we'll talk about what theory means in a minute. It's not what you think. So um, evolution, we can watch happening in a lab. Um, once you understand how genetics works and how you go from DNA to protein to trait, the rest is, is pudding. It really makes sense. So we're going to uh, talk about microevolution and apply that to macroevolution. And finally, we're going to take these principles and take a look at what's happening in the world today. What's happening to this diversity of species we have? Uh, we have issues like pollution, climate change, you know, habitat degradation. And so the diversity of life we have now, we may not have for our future generations. And not only that, well, how do we conserve it? You know, what kinds of things are different now? And, and how is changing the processes that organisms have, the interactions that they have, how is that going to change their evolutionary future? And so all of this, when you combine it with things like politics and economics and philosophy and ethics, all those actually take biology into a new field of study called environmental science. So we'll touch on that at the end of the course. So I just want to leave you in this segment with this thought. I've talked a little bit about evolution, and some of you are like, oh, evolution, I don't know, I don't believe in that. Um, well, we're going to take it from a purely scientific point of view, and we're going to try to dispel a lot of the myths that are out there. So some of you may have had textbooks in grade school where, you know, it shows like the monkey and then it's coming up higher, it's coming up higher, becoming a human. 
Get that picture out of your mind. That is not what evolution about is about. Evolution is change in populations genetics over time. But evolution is the central concept in modern biology. All the stuff about biotechnology, you can't really make sense of it if you don't understand how evolutionary biology works. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there, but it's the central concept in modern biology, as this guy right here said. This is uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, very famous modern biologist, and he said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and that is so true. So everything we talk about this semester is centered around this idea of change through time, evolution, change in a population in terms of its genetics over time. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, you know, I'm religious. I don't know if I can buy that. You know, can religion and science coexist? Very, very good question. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter what your religion is. You can still study and appreciate evolutionary biology. And an article you might be interested in reading um, from Time Magazine back in 2006. It was called uh, God versus Science. And they actually took two very famous biologists, in a sense evolutionary biologists, uh, one named um, um, Richard Dawkins, and he's out at Oxford, and another guy named Francis Collins. And Richard Dawkins, very famous atheist evolutionary biologist, Fran uh, Francis Collins is the, a very famous um, geneticist who discovered or who pioneered the Human Genome Project, but he is a very devout Christian. And so the two of them are discussing um, whether um, evolutionary biology and religion are compatible and they both study evolution yet they come from very different philosophical and religious points of view so you might be interested in checking out that article so can you study evolution without abandoning your faith I say absolutely because evolution in the biological world is based on the scientific method of inquiry and that's what this next se segment of lecture is going to be talking about so what we do in biology uses a scientific inquiry, a scientific method of inquiry, whereas faiths use a faith-based method of inquiry. And these two operate in different spheres, different realms. So as long as you can operate in this realm and you can operate in this realm, there's no reason why they can't be compatible. But we'll talk more about that when we get to our evolutionary biology unit. So uh, anyway, I look forward to uh, seeing you in the next lecture segment and on the discussion board. Until then, take care and don't forget to read your chapters. All the best. Bye-bye.